On the other side of this disc, our first half, we explained the basic design of wet sleeve engines. We also went through a few key servicing procedures that are special to the wet sleeves. Now on this side, our second half, we're ready to run through step-by-step -step liner and piston replacement procedures. Here we'll be using our 2.2 liter Type J engine. We'll cover head removal using our shearing technique and liner clamping. Along the way, we'll also take time out to get into head and block cleaning and how to handle aluminum components and also how to check the head for warpage when you can or can't resurface. And of course, we'll review how to remove the pistons and liners. Then we'll go through reinstallation, getting it all back together again. We'll get into new liner installation and arrangement, liner protrusion measurement. We'll cover how to assemble the piston to the connecting rod, how to install the rings on the pistons, then we'll discuss putting everything back into the cylinder block. At this point, we'll cover head and gasket installation, what you have to watch for, how a diesel is different. We'll also touch on valve adjustment, unique on the J-type engine we'll be using. Finally, we'll touch briefly on the engine's cooling system. So let's take our wet sleeve engine apart and reassemble it. Many procedures here are the same as with any engine. They can and should be performed in car, but we're doing ours on an engine stand so you can better see what we're doing. After removing the rocker cover, timing belt, and valve train components, etc., we're ready to remove the head. First, remove all bolts except one, which becomes our pivot bolt. The pivot bolt varies by engine because of dowel locations, so refer to your manuals for the proper one. On this engine, it's this one. Now we loosen this bolt only one quarter to one half of a turn. Then tap the head using a rubber mallet or wooden block. We pivot the head just enough to break the seal between the head and block. As soon as the head moves, the seal is broken. So now we can remove that final pivot bolt. This shearing technique protects the liners from accidental pull-ups. You don't want debris falling down between liners and block shoulders, which could foul up liner protrusion and cause a coolant leak. We now remove the head gasket. Once it's removed, we can proceed with a complete removal of the liners and pistons as part of our teardown. But a note of caution, at this point, the head no longer holds the liners in place, so do not turn the engine over without first holding them in place with a special tool. The slightest liner movement will let debris get between the liner and the engine block. For this engine, we use our MOT588 liner clamp. This step must be taken before proceeding with any block disassembly, so you can rotate the crankshaft without fear of breaking the seal between the liner and block shoulder. But hold it, time out. There's another area we should talk about before proceeding. So let's interrupt our teardown process and turn our attention to the head and block surfaces. Start with cleanup. For this engine, we clean both the head and block mating surfaces using an appropriate chemical gasket remover suitable for use on aluminum, such as Permatex 4MA. Be very careful here. Even for stubborn areas, make sure you never use a conventional gasket scraper on any aluminum components. Aluminum cannot withstand this type of treatment without getting damaged. To be safe, use a soft wooden block for the tough spots. Now, if by visual inspection the cylinder head seems to be suitable for reuse, it should still be double-checked for warpage. To check for head warpage, place a straight edge diagonally on the head face then inspect all around for clearances that would indicate warp using a feeler gauge. The specification for this engine is two thousandth of an inch, or 0 0.05 millimeters. This is the maximum allowable warpage or distortion for a head to be considered reusable as is. What happens next depends on whether or not you're working on an overhead cam engine. Any warpage more than specification on an overhead cam engine, like the one we're working on, means the head must be replaced it cannot be resurfaced. Here you can see why. When a head warps, the whole thing warps, not just the lower combustion deck surface. Those camshaft bearing bores are no longer in line either, and that's not good for the bearing bores or the camshaft itself. So if you have an overhead cam engine, forget about resurfacing the head. Replace it. On pushrod type engines with adjustable tappets, however, it's okay to resurface to remove warpage. 
provided you do not remove so much metal that the head ends up thinner than the repair thickness specified in the workshop manual. Anything less than this will create valve to piston clearance problems, change compression ratio, and adversely affect emission levels. Note too, you have a standard thickness and a repair thickness. Be sure to refer to your workshop manual for guidance. What you do first is measure the head thickness to see if it's already been resurfaced. Using this thickness measurement, subtract your measured amount of warp. If the result is less than the allowable repair thickness, replace the head. Now let's look at a piston liner and rod disassembly. When working on an engine stand, make sure the liner clamp is properly installed before turning the engine over. This will prevent the liners and pistons from falling out when you unbolt the connecting rods from the crankshaft. Before you unbolt each rod from the crankshaft, number each rod and cap set one through four. Number one is always at the flywheel end. This numbering should be made on the rod side specified in the workshop manual. It varies by engine. On this engine, the marks go on the intermediate shaft side. Then remove the bolts or nut bolt arrangements. Since they are self-locking, they are good for one time only, so throw them away and replace with new ones. The next step depends upon liner and piston conditions. First, of course, you remove the clamp to free the liner and piston assemblies. Next, you remove the assemblies from the block. If they're reusable, mark them as sets, piston A with liner A, and so on, to make sure you keep them together. But let's assume the liners and pistons need replacement. Then remove the pistons from the liners. Now you're ready to disassemble the pistons and rods. Here, using tool MOT 574.11, rest the piston in the V of the support base with the wrist pin over the extraction hole. Then, selecting the right size extracting mandrel, press out the pin. Carefully inspect each connecting rod and cap. If only one is a problem, replace all four because they are factory balanced and are available only in a set of four. All there is left to this segment is a short review which should give you no trouble at all, if you followed our game film, that is. Let's find out. It's tough to be a quarterback these days. Seems nobody loves you, but everybody loves to pull things apart, particularly those blitzing linebackers who pull apart the offensive passing attack, and sometimes the offensive passer. Great fun, partly because it's always easier to take something apart than to put it together successfully. That's certainly true of engine overhaul. Ask any weekend mechanic, he'll tell you. But you're not weekend mechanics. You're full-time professionals, and you should have no trouble putting it all together, provided you follow step-by-step -step directions. At this point, we'll assume you've torn the engine down, as you see here. Some parts are to be automatically replaced. This includes items such as gaskets, seals, and the like. With others, it depends upon the condition of the parts. Best check your workshop manual for guidance. The important point to stress here is that you never try to replace an individual liner or piston. If you need to replace one of these parts, replace all of them for all four cylinders, liners, pistons, rings, and wrist pins. A complete set of four, precision matched at the factory, are provided in this carton. Whenever you open the carton, use everything in it on that one engine. Don't try to mix and match. This is the best time, too, to mark the sets before the pistons get separated from their mated liners. Mark them A and A, B and B, and so on. Then remove the pistons from their liners. For reassembly, we start with a cylinder liner. This part couldn't be simpler, a metal liner. But as we explained on the other side of the disc, the important part is controlling with precision how much the liner protrudes above the block surface once installed. On some of our engines, such as the 810, we do this in the selection of the gaskets that sit on the shoulders down in the block. Here, these gaskets act as shims as well as seals. 
In most of our engines, however, including this type, we use O-ring seals. They do not affect liner protrusion because the liners rest in the block, metal to metal. So let's discuss liner protrusion standards on this basis. Now install the liners in the block. There are three separate measurement standards that the liners must meet. First, liner protrusion above the block must fall between the low and high spec as shown in the workshop manual. On a type J engine, it's three to six thousandths of an inch, or 0.08 to 0.15 millimeters. Using tools MOT251.01 and MOT252.01, you measure liner protrusion. Be sure to record all measurements. The second standard is that the maximum difference between any two adjacent liners cannot exceed specified limits. On our type J, it happens to be two thousandths of an inch, or 0.05 millimeters. And third, the protrusion should be arranged to form a step sequence so that the liners rise from one end of the block to the other. When you have the liners arranged so that all three criteria are met, remark them as to location in the block, starting with number one at the flywheel end. We're ready now to proceed with installing our piston rod liner assemblies into the block. But let's review first how we put these assemblies together. Again, the existence of our liner is the main difference here. The basic sequence is, one, assemble the rods and wrist pins into the pistons. Two, install the piston rings onto the pistons. And three, insert the assembled rods and pistons into the liners. We covered most of this on the other side of this disc, but let's briefly hit the high points for you again. When mounting the rod and wrist pin into the piston, use our MOT 574.11 toolkit. Just be sure to select the right size mandrel and thrust pin. The toolkit includes the different sizes necessary to service all current Renault and Jeep wet sleeve engines. Be sure you align the pistons and rods in proper relation to each other. Since the correct alignment varies by engine, check your workshop manual. After heating the rod evenly on a hot plate, insert it into the piston and quickly insert the mandrel and pin into the piston until it bottoms on the support base. When it comes to installing rings on the pistons, the end gaps of the three rings should be 120 degrees apart. And the letter O, or word top, on the compression ring must be facing toward the piston top. Finally, the rings are pre-gapped. Don't try to change the gap by cutting or filing. At this point, you will already have marked the pistons and liners as sets, either during teardown or when removing them from the carton. So now we're ready for final assembly. First, of course, you install the new liner seals. Next, you install the piston, liner, and rod assembly. A simple step, not really different from installing a piston into a conventional engine. Just make certain the sequence is right, with the number one piston and liner at the flywheel end, and with all piston arrows pointing to the flywheel. Now you install the liner clamp, tool MOT588, to hold everything in place before turning the engine over in the stand. After pulling the rods down onto the lubricated crank journals, mount the bearing caps and remaining bearing inserts, making sure from the markings that they match with the respective connecting rods. Then install new bearing cap nuts or bolts as applicable. Use a torque wrench to tighten the nuts to specs, 44 to 48 foot-pounds on this Type J. When all four sets are assembled, double check to make sure the assembly turns freely. At this point, we're ready for head assembly. But first, a word from the sponsor about head gaskets. This is a Renault Jeep original equipment head gasket. It already has its own built-in sealer, so never use any other additional sealer for this gasket. And remember, these are wet sleeve engines. You don't want coolant getting into the combustion chamber because of an inferior head gasket. Neither does your customer. Always use Renault Jeep OEM replacement head gaskets. Another point, on our diesel engines, the thickness of the head gasket controls the engine's compression ratio, and even a slight change in ratio can greatly affect diesel performance. So make the necessary measurements and calculations to determine which of the three available thicknesses is correct. Check your workshop manual.
After removing the liner clamp, install the cylinder head locating pin, tool MOT720. Mount the head gasket dry. If it has a hot top mark on it, mount this face up. If it has no marking, it will only go on one way. Now, carefully position the head onto the block and screw in the cylinder head mounting bolts finger tight. Torque tighten them in the correct steps in order per manual specifications and remove the locating pin. Now let me take a moment aside here and talk briefly about valve train assembly, specifically rocker arm adjustment. As a general rule, wet sleeve engines are no different than monoblock engines when it comes to valve trains. The type J engine is unique because there are two different procedures used here for rocker arm adjustment, depending on whether or not the timing belt cover has a rear window. Some do, some don't. Make sure you follow the correct procedure for the engine you're working on. It's all spelled out in the manual. Just make sure you use tool MOT647 for the adjustments. It works for both arrangements. All other current Renault wet sleeve engines use this chart as a guide for valve adjusting, an even simpler procedure. Your job doesn't end there, however. We still have the cooling system to check out. You should exercise special care when you refill the cooling system. Naturally, you want to add enough antifreeze to make sure the customer is fully protected in your area of the country. Full details on the cooling system are covered in your workshop manuals. We also have a Renault Cooling System Service Training Video Disc. It's part number 898-132-1150. The important point to remember is to make sure you have fully bled all air from the system. Don't take shortcuts. Just a little air left in the system is all it takes to blow a head gasket in a wet sleeve engine. And don't forget to do a final recheck of head bolt torque and rocker arm clearance. You do this after the engine's been run up to operating temperature and then allowed to cool down for at least two and a half hours. In normal torque sequence, Loosen the number one bolt about half a turn. Then tighten it to proper torque specifications. Repeat the procedure for the remaining bolts in proper sequence. Then readjust the rocker arms. As I said earlier, it's all a lot like football. It's not enough to be individually talented. You have to know all the plays to contribute to the team. This disc gave you some key plays to bone up on but that's just part of your training. You recognize this, I'm sure. It's your course catalog, the guide to what's available. You know where your strengths and weaknesses are. How much time are you spending at the training center? It's all right there, waiting for you. And so is your final review. The clock's running out. <laughs>